I would now like to move on and introduce our next uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Simon Carter. So he's a research chemist. So I'm happy to introduce you all the people with a chemical background and was working in automotive environmental protection, but then kind of moved a little bit in different directions. So I got a PhD at uh, Lancaster University um, in, and but moved more into medical sociology and uh, communication groups. Um, and um, he worked as a medical sociologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, he's now at the Department of Sociology at the uh, Open University. His research interest um, is in between health and medicine and also the impact of variables and digital health. And uh, the, the title of his uh, presentation here, Sun and Us, a historical sociology, sociology perspective on our relationship with sunlight. I like this very much, a relationship with sunlight. So Simon, all yours, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, hopefully we can all meet in person in some time in the future. I'm just gonna share my screen. Hi. So, um, yeah, as, as, as it was said, I'm a medical sociologist and um, my research interests have, have been around, well, part of my research interests have been about our changing attitudes to sunlight. I'm mainly going to be talking about the British and European context. Other places might have slightly different histories. My main argument is that between the late 19th century and the mid 20th century, social attitudes to sunlight changed dramatically moving from one of bodily isolation to a photophilic relationship to the sun. Um, and this is my book, which goes into a lot more detail about what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon. So at the end of the 19th century, there was a discourse around sunlight that regarded it as dangerous and bodily isolation was the pres prescribed norm. Medical journals in the period talked about an epidemic of sunstroke and there was speculation that the sun produced the toxin in the blood on its action on the skin produced the toxin on the blood, which was akin to snake poison. Um, and this BMJ report from 1896 is very typical of the type of thing at the, at, the, at the time. It reports on an 18th month old child who died after being exposed to the sun at the seaside. And this is a quote from the paper. This is one, this is but one example of the evil effects of a practice which can be seen in full swing every day at our seaside washing places, little children paddling with their heads exposed to the blazing sun. There were also fears about um, those people who were stationed overseas in European colonies. Um, and here it was thought that sunlight caused the disease called tropical neurasemia. And the protective gear, which we can see these men wearing, was typically a pith helmet. There were also metalized curtains incorporated into clothing to protect the spine. And the then director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine recommended that staff stationed overseas should wear red underwear to protect their vital organs. Women were thought to be at a slightly different risk. And here, sun exposure was thought to cause sun tanning, which would then give away undesirable social origins. Um, and so there were many advertisements in the period about bleaching products to remove any trace of uh, sun tanning, which may uh, appear on women. So the move, the turn towards the sun had multiple reasons, and I'm just going to concentrate on two this afternoon, the cultural and the medical. So I'll start with the cultural. And there were several popular movements in the, at the beginning of the 20th century that underpinned with, uh, were underpinned with sentiments of pastoralism. That is a nostalgic desire for a purer, natural way of life away from the perceived evils of city life. They sought to establish a nexus around three elements, morality, health, and nature. And there's two examples I'm going to give today. First was the Boy Scouts, which was established by Baden-Powell in the first decade of the 20th century. And part of the reason it was established was because of fears of moral degeneracy amongst urban boys, particularly working class boys and lower middle class boys. And the solution was thought to be muscular Christianity. This was the outdoor codified physical activities away from cities. Um, and the suntan here became a marker that young men have been involved in such morally worthy activities. Also in the period, camping became a popular 
that was becoming an increasingly popular pastime. And Thomas Holding established a camping club in the first decade of the 20th century. And he wrote the book Cycle and Camping um, in 1897. And here's the front cover we can see prominent picture of the sun and a family enjoying camping under the sun. And he frequently extolled the themes of bodily exposure to sunlight. I now turn to medical reasons. And um, there are many health challenges in this period, but, it's, but foremost amongst those was tuberculosis. And this is a exhibition in Switzerland in 1913 about tuberculosis and a poster for it. But it was also a time of transformation in Benson with increasing ideas of professionalism. Um, and we could see this in, 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 in the increasing fragmentation of medicine into specialisms that tended to concentrate on particular bodily organs. The, underpin, the increasing underpinning of medicine with scientific research and the beginning of statistical methods in medicine, increasing standardization and certification of training, both within countries and between countries, and greater state regulation. Many welcomed these changes, and the, and the possibilities of medicine were thought to be endless. But not all were happy with the direction that medicine was heading in. Some suggested alternative approaches. Amongst these were the medical holists. They argued that the, there were great dangers in a move away from general, generalist medical skills. And they argued that the patient needed to be treated as a whole individual rather than separate organs. TB became a focus of, of, of the medical holists. In this period, tuberculosis had been in decline since about 1850, but it still infected large numbers of people. And the prognosis for anyone infected was bleak. The traditional treatments were often very invasive, painful, and were largely ineffective. Into this space moved the medical holists. Part of the response to the TB program was the sanatorium movement. And this had been popular in Europe since the mid 19th century. And the idea behind it was that rest and removal from the frenetic pace of modern life would aid a cure. Increasingly into, this, into the sun, sanatorium cure was added sunlight. And this became known as heliotherapy. The work of August Rollier was particularly influential in this period. Rollier established his sunlight clinic in Laysen in Switzerland in 1903. And in 1914, he published a textbook based on his experiences working at the sunlight clinic called The Cure de Soleil, first published in French. It was translated into English in 1923 under the title Heliotherapy. And it was reprinted and widely cited in the 1920s and 30s, both in, internationally. The book stressed the ancient origins of the sun cure and it argued for a holistic approach to the treatment. It argued that sunlight was a tonic that would allow the body to increase its natural resistance and therefore cure itself. And here we see a picture of um, Rollier's um, children's clinic at the top and his main hospital at the bottom. And then so you can just see two men here skiing in loincloths, which was part of the treatment. Um, So we take some examples from Britain where we see that heliotherapy became widely adopted within sanatoria. The first was from a sanatorium in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in central England. And here you can see some of the design features of a typical sanatoria that used heliotherapy. There was large verandas which patients could be wild, wheeled out of their wards and there were large French windows which would open wide and allow beds to be wheeled out onto the veranda. This example here is from the Midhurst Sanatorium, which operated from 1902 to the 1950s. And it was um, built after a design competition. And you can see the curved frontage of the building, which allowed the maximum ingress of sunlight. It also incorporated a step design so that the patients on the lower floors would not be overshadowed by balconies on the upper floors. Also in this period, actinotherapy became very popular. This is the use of artificial sunlight for therapeutic reasons. And on the left, we can see a Finson lamp, which was being used to treat tubercular lesions on the skin. And on the right, you can see children being prophylactically exposed to sun lamps to prevent illness. So now I'm gonna move on to what I call building a heliosis, popularizing, popularizing sunlight. 
So it began to be argued that if the sunlight was a tonic for sick, it would also strengthen the healthy. One, there were various organizations who promoted this, but the foremost of this was the Sunlight League, which also produced the journal, Sunlight, a journal of light and truth. It was established in 1924, and it lobbied for mass exposure to sunlight, also for smoke abatement, which prevented sunlight reaching cities, the clearance of slums, which didn't have that much exposure to sunlight, and also bathing dress reform, particularly for men. This period was a, became a period of increasing fascination and popularization of, of sunlight exposure. And see, these are some advertisements from the period. We began to see advertisements in much of the press for sun lamps. And these weren't sun lamps to cure the sick. They were to keep people healthy, keep fit with ultraviolet. It was also, also vitamin D became quite popular. Vitamin D had been discovered by Edward Mellenby in the early 20s. And by the end of the 20s, you saw a version such as this one called Radiostol, the scientific substitute for sunshine. Also in the period, Vitaglass appeared. Vita, most, much glass is actually fairly opaque to ultraviolet rays. Vitaglass was an invention which allowed ultraviolet rays to pass through the windows. Let the health rays of daylight permanently through Vitaglass windows. Also in this period, we began to see sunlight introduced into the built environment. Um, so the first example I've got here is the Garden City Movement, um, which was proposed by Ebenezer Howard, who thought there was a problem with unhealthy urbanism. And he proposed new forms of community where sunlight was central. Um, and then the architects who built much of the um, Welling Garden City and Lecture of Garden City, Barry Parker and Raymond Unwin, were known as the sunlight architects. And here we see an advertisement, yesterday living and working in the smoke, today living in the suburbs, working in the smoke, tomorrow living and working in the sun in Wedding Garden City. Sunlight also became, began to be designed into health centers. Um, and these new health centers weren't primarily to treat the sick, they were to promote health itself. And this is one of the most famous ones, the Finsbury Health Center. And you can see here the open planning idea which allowed sun from any angle to pass into the building and this theme was carried on in the interior of the building where you can see the sun featured on the walls um, fresh air day and night and there was a solarium as well in the in the building and the final the final thing were the lidos which appeared throughout the 30s um, and these were urban liminal spaces which can be contrasted to the indoor swimming pools of the period which were very serious places where swimming was often still segregated. The Lidos, on the other hand, were, were relatively anarchic. Families could go together to them and get undressed and then start bathing. Um, and this one is the De, De La Loire Pavilion from Bexhill, which was built in 1935, designed by Eric Mendelssohn. And it follows the, the um, internationally modernist style with a marine aesthetic. And again, you can see the large windows which allowed sunlight in. It also incorporated a library, a theater and a solarium again. So in conclusion, what can we say about this period? What were the long-term consequences of this period? I would argue that this period established the idea of sunlight and the suntan as healthy. And that's something which has continued to, the, to this day even despite the last 20 or 30 years of having public health messages saying that sunlight exposure is very dangerous, most people still believe that having a suntan, a bit of a suntan, and exposing yourself to sunlight is, is, is quite healthy. The post-World War II era also saw an increasing desire to seek out the sun, and in, it's argued that this was the main driver of mass tourism in this period, particularly mass tourism that took, that took off from the 70s and the 80s, where people wanted to go places where they could be assured of, seeing, of receiving at least two or three weeks of sunlight. Also, the practices of materials of treatment from this period became increasingly demedicalized, um, literally. So uh, many of the places where the affluent went to seek the sun cure, which were predominantly Switzerland, the Italian and French Rivieras became tourist destinations. And much of the design that we, I've mentioned about the sanatoria was then actually incorporated into hotels and many of the Santora actually became hotels. So my central argument is that social movements from even a hundred years ago cast a very long opposite of a shadow almost into the future. Thank you.